Welcome back to One Piece Explained. The One Piece anime just got a brand new opening and there are a ton of little easter eggs and details throughout it, so I figured I'd go ahead and break it all down. This opening is titled Asu, which translates to Ah, like the exclamation. It's sung by Hiroshi Kitadani, who you may be familiar with from a few other One Piece openings, such as We Are, We Go, and more recently, Over the Top. Now this is probably one of my favorite openings ever, from the song choice to the fun and energetic animation style, it's just incredible. So let's just get right into it. Spoiler warning, I am going to be talking about details from throughout the Egghead arc, going up to approximately chapter 1100, so if you're not caught up yet, you may not want to watch this video as it will definitely impact your experience and that's something we try to avoid on this channel. So if you're continuing this video, do so at your own risk. Thank you. We open on a bird's eye view of the Thousand Sunny and quickly zoom in toward the Straw Hats. This portion is actually an adaptation of chapter 1060, with Luffy falling on his back and announcing his dream to the crew. The majority of episode 1089, the very episode that this opening debuted, is actually an adaptation of this chapter. Now most of the crew is on the main deck, but on an upper level you can briefly make out Frankie. We zoom in a tad bit and can see Robin reading the newspaper on the stairs, with Nami in front of her on this bench. Over to the side are Zoro and Sanji having just finished their little fight, and Luffy is positioned toward the center of the deck. Below him are both Chopper and Usopp, with Brook stationed back at the table. When we get a close-up of Luffy's face, you'll notice the same exact bandages from after his fights on Wano. Now this opening starts off the same way it finishes at the very end, as we get this scene from a different perspective, seeing Chopper, Usopp, and Brook looking back at Luffy. There has been a slight modification though, with Luffy having been initially positioned facing towards the three of them in this opening, while in the source material, he was perpendicular to Nami. And this may be why we don't see Jinbei in this portion, because he's actually positioned right behind where the mast is, and as such he's being covered up from this perspective. But we do have Caribou in his barrel off to the side. We move on to a title sequence with the whole crew in their egghead outfits. Sanji is head over heels for Nami's, just like he was in chapter 1064. Luffy messes with his dom shoes a bit and ends up flying off the screen, very similar to how he did in chapter 1066. The title transitions into a montage of various scenes from across the first part of the egghead arc, as we get a shot of the Vega Force 1 holding the Thousand Sunny, and underneath the ocean you can spot the silhouettes of the sea beast weapons, which we also saw in the manga. Then comes the shot of Luffy, Chopper, Jinbei, and an obfuscated jewelry bonnie chowing down on some food from the automated cooking machine. Then comes the crew enjoying themselves while jumping across the island clouds, before we cut to Luffy in the island scrapyard, turning around to tease the iron giant. Next we get a quick introduction to the satellites. Shaka and Lilith are modeled after their back and forth from chapter 1071, while Atlas is in her combat stance and Edison is shown flying. This depiction of York and Pythagoras however seems to be brand new. This all leads to a tease of Luchi, Hattori, Kaku, and Stussy with Vegapunk all distressed. And I love how we get their masks overlaid on top. Really cool choice. We then get this quick sequence of Luffy and Chopper looking around the lab, which looks to be when the two searched for Vegapunk and Bonnie. We even get Luffy's Dom shoes malfunctioning, just like Chopper had said. This tires Luffy out, and we transition to him sitting alongside Zoro on the couch. The screen in the back starts projecting some holograms of the satellites in Vegapunk, with York giving us this no good smile. Before it transitions to some marines, we've got Kizaru, Vice Admiral Dahl, Hibari, Helmeppo, and Garp here. Then the cross guild crew comes on top, and I love how Zoro is a bit hesitant at this with him looking at Mihawk. This doesn't last too long though, as Luffy goes gear 5th and crashes through the monitor. He pulls out his mysterious goggles just like in the manga, and heads down to the Fabrio phase where we get a quick glimpse at one of the hologram space creatures. We then cut to Kobe running through Folo Lead with Hibari, terrified of the giant skull on Folo Lead. Though this is not a direct adaptation of this scene as Pizarro wouldn't use this power to move the island's arms and legs until after Hibari was on the marine ship. We get this quick scene of Luffy, Jinbei, and Chopper falling while growing older and younger. This is a reference to the scene from the source material where Bonnie accidentally alters their age, with the hand and the jewels in the back being a nod to her powers manifesting age as jewels. And there's even the lock to the paw room that Bonnie destroyed with her powers. Now there are a couple of neat blink and you'll miss it moments in the background, so let's just get right into that. You can make out some symbols on Kuma's clothing, such as the one on his Bible and shirt, as well as the paw symbol, but not only that, we get a silhouette of Nika right here. But then, we get this shadowy figure resembling Saturn's demonic silhouette, as we saw throughout this arc. I can't believe that they put him in here as a teaser. There's more though, as we get the target that the slaves were on their back during the God Valley incident, as well as the hoof of the Celestial Dragon. But one more, we also get the pattern of sapphire scales that Bonnie developed on her face as a kid. A lot of foreshadowing going on to future events. 
Atlas gives a high five to someone, and this looks to be an adaptation of her saying goodbye to Luffy and the group. This could also be her waving to the crew later on in the lab, but given the background, it looks to be taking place down on the Fabio phase. There's then this fantastic shot of Beppo, Penguin, and Sachi, all gender bent due to the effect of the feminization disease, while water fills up the submarine. We get this fun depiction of Hibari, Gruce, Kujaku, and Helmeppo surrounded by nameless Blackbeard pirate crewmates before they get pacified with this nod to the GP flowers. This transitions into Sentimaru standing before a group of Mark III pacifista, and speaking of, we also get this under angle shot of Kuma breaking free from his connected wires before taking off. There's this really cool shot of S-Shark falling into the ground as if it's water thanks to his abilities, and this seems to be an adaptation of his fight with Nami and Brook. We also see a young Sentomaru mesmerized by Kizaru's laser powers, a scene adapting this brief flashback from chapter 1089. There's also a very interesting shot of Shaka turning around all menacingly while we see a bunch of handprints and men in hats. This is of course the cipher pole agents that are trapped on the island. I like how this makes it look like this is Shaka's doing as many fans speculated throughout the arc. Although we know who the real perpetrator is, I do wonder if there's more to Shaka than we think. We then cut to a hand petting a snake on the head. Now the seraphim are fairly large, so this hand has to be as well, and as we know, this is likely York as an adaptation of the scene from chapter 1075, although the presence of the other seraphim suggests that this could also be adapting 1079. We get another shot of various jewels alluding to Bonnie's powers, but then there's this really cool sequence of Luffy and the Straw Hats going through their various outfits from across the series. We start with Luffy as it goes in reverse chronological order, starting with his clothes from the Egghead arc, then the Onigashima raid, then Wano, then the wedding outfit, and his whole cake island look, his dress rosa outfit, his coliseum armor, his punk hazard outfit, his regular post time skip outfit, the marine furred outfit, his impel down outfit, the embroidered version from Amazon Lily, his Sabaudi archipelago fit, his thriller bark outfit, his appearance during Water 7 and Enya's lobby, the Afro Luffy appearance of course, his appearance during Jaya and Skypiea, the outfit he wore during the end of Alabasta, and the one he wore toward the middle of it, his drum island outfit with Nami's coat and the ripped sleeve, and finally, his iconic base outfit for most of the first part of the story. But then, there's this crazy detail here with the ground they walk through. Each different strip of land represents a different arc, and the characters outfits change depending on what they're walking on. We start off with Luffy in his Marineford outfit as he walks through the ground with rubble all around him. He then steps into what looks to be the terrain of Fishman Island as Nami and Zoro join. The next patch covered in snow is Punk Hazard, and then the tiled ground is Dress Rosa. Now, two things of note, when Sanji steps on the Dress Rosa strip, he looks to actually be wearing his second outfit from Zoro. So, and when Jinbei steps on the Punk Hazard strip, he's shown with his outfit from the Whole Cake Island arc. But as we cut away, we see Luffy, Nami, and then Sanji in their Whole Cake Island wedding outfits, but since Zoro was already in Wano during that time, he's shown in his Wano outfit, but not the one that we first saw him in when he was being tried. But by this point, the outfits get a bit off pattern as Luffy is in his raid outfit without the overcoat, Zoro is in his post time skip outfit, and Sanji has one of the Whole Cake Island looks before they all transition into their egghead outfits once again. We get this brief shot of Luffy vs. Luchi in their awakened forms, and we get some confirmation here that the Hagoromo around him is actually just pitch black. A gear flying from their fight transitions into Kid using his damned punk before clashing with Shanks, who seems to be intentionally obscured or hidden here, only showing the back of his head. This switches into Blackbeard vs. Law and Kuzan vs. Garp. Interesting that these weren't deemed worthy enough to obfuscate in any way. And this continues into S Hawk vs. Zoro, and we get Luffy and Luchi clashing again, just like in the manga, which was actually a call back to their fight for many as lobby. The clash from their fists transitions into flame and shadow as we get a glimpse of Sabo's time at Mary Joie, and you can briefly make out the shadowy arrow-like tail that struck Cobra and Sabo during their run-in with the Elders. Now this brings us to Karasu's crows from his soot, soot powers, which transitions into a pack of news coup. Now this location here is very curious, I can't quite place my finger on it, but seeing as how this transitions us into Morgan's covering up Wapple and Vivi with his hands, or wings or whatever, this makes me think that this could actually be the Aegis Kingdom. Now, we've never actually seen this country yet in the manga, but Wapple and Vivi would stow away on the ship of the Aegis Kingdom after the reverie. Aegis is ruled by King T the Fourth, who has a very British inspired design, and the word Aegis looks to be inspired by Japanese words which refer to the United Kingdom. 
coupling that with this clock tower that somewhat resembles Big Ben, a famous clock tower located in London, we could be seeing Morgans and his flock of Nuzku approaching the kingdom to pick up Wapole and Vivi here. We then get this cut of books descending into the water, referring to the knowledge of Ohara being saved by the lake. This transitions into two figures holding bouquets, a rendition of the brief flashback we got with Vegapunk and Dragon. This all takes us into a shot of Emu sitting upon the empty throne with their mysterious butterflies all around. This takes us to a climax with all of our various quote unquote protagonists in the arc facing their own adversity throughout it, with Sabo, Kid, Law, and Kobe. Behind Law, you can make out the rock structures from Winter Island, and as Kobe leaps forward, we transition to Vivi running through this hole, likely in reference to the hole chewed out by Wapole, though she escaped by hopping into his mouth in the manga. This turns into Bonnie approaching the bubble of Kuma's memories in the paw room, with her embracing of it bringing us to the Straw Hats walking across Egghead. We get an abridged version of the iconic Grand Line map, featuring the seven different routes, before cutting back to where this all started, with Luffy telling the crew about his dream. And that's about it for all I wanted to cover on this opening. If there's anything you think that I missed, let me know in the comments, or just let me know what your favorite part of this new opening was. If you enjoyed this breakdown, please consider subscribing. I do weekly manga breakdowns here on this channel, as well as all other major One Piece related things, such as the Monsters anime adaptation that will be coming out later this month. The anime is heading into the Egghead arc, so I'm sure I'll have way more to say in the near future. If you made it this far into the video, thank you so much for watching, stay safe, and I hope to see you in the next one.